I'm sure everyone in this room is well aware, obesity rates are at an all-time high in Canada. It, data from 2009 to 2011 showed the majority of adults 18 to 79 are overweight or obese. And the Canadian, results from the Canadian Health Measures Survey has also shown a deterioration in the weight status of young people in Canada. So kids 5 to 17 years old in 1981, 14% of them were overweight and obese, and as you can see in 2009, it has um, almost doubled. So given that the prevalence of overweight and obesity is so high, it makes it very difficult to, um, to address uh, each and every one of these people who are already obese or who are at the highest risk of obese one by one. So population health um, approaches to obesity prevention are likely part of the solution. And what exactly do I mean by population health intervention? So like I said, instead of investing all of our efforts into um, supporting people who are already living with obesity or who are at the highest risk of obesity, what a population health um, approach does is tries to shift the risk of the majority of the population um, shown in the before and after curves so we don't necessarily have a huge effect on individuals, but we have a very small effect on many, many, or a large number of people. And population health interventions often come in the form of sort of environmental shifts or modifications to where we live, work, and play, often in the form of policy, but can also be changes to your built environment in your residential neighborhoods, the built environment in your school, if you are a child and attending school, the built environment in your workplace, Etc. So physical inactivity is a risk factor for many chronic diseases, including obesity, and is a big part of um, the studies that I'm conducting right now. So uh, again, results from the Canadian Health Measures Survey indicated that 6% of boys and 2% of girls 15 to 19 years of age are achieving Canada's physical activity recommendations of 60 plus minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per day. Which then indicates that a large number of youth in Canada are inactive. And one of the uh, major concerns about this is that physical inactivity among young people will often lead to high levels of physical activity among adults. So there's a carryover effect. Given these statistics, um, as well as statistics that um, were leading up to the 2009-2011 results of the Canadian Health Measures Survey, uh, the provincial government of Manitoba implemented a province-wide physical education policy in secondary schools. And I don't know how familiar you, are, feel familiar you are with this policy, but before September 2008 when the policy was implemented, physical education was mandatory in grades 9 and 10 in Manitoba. And after the policy, physical education was mandatory for all kids in grades 9 through 12. And this was the first time in Canada that physical education has ever been mandatory for grades 11 and 12 kids. And one of the really unique aspects of this policy is that part of the physical education credit included a physical activity practicum. So as part of the practicum, or in order to achieve the credit, the students had to participate in 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity on at least five days a week while they were enrolled in phys ed. So we just actually published a paper this month, um, it's being released this month, in the Journal of Obesity. And the objectives of this, um, of this paper were to examine changes in moderate to vigorous physical activity over time among Manitoba adolescents in the context of this physical education policy, as well as to identify factors that were associated with these changes. And to do this study, we um, randomly selected uh, secondary schools in Manitoba to reflect the geographical composition in Manitoba. We um, recruited 70% of our schools from urban areas and 30% of our schools from rural areas. And then we conveniently sampled or recruited students within each of these schools. So grades 9 and 10 who were in mandatory phys ed classes at our baseline year, we recruited them into our study. <coughs> our baseline data collection happened between April to October 2008, so before the uh, Manitoba Phys Ed policy was implemented, and we successfully recruited 596 grade 9 and 10 students 
We ask them to wear accelerometers for seven consecutive days, as well as to complete the <coughs> health survey, which is a sort of census-based survey that your regional health, uh, health authorities um, implement in the school system as a school. <coughs> school. And at baseline, after the kids, um, after we were finished collecting our data, uh, John did a fabulous job with his team and what successfully had 447 grade 9 and 10 students return their accelerometers, which is a feed in <coughs> itself, but also return quality, uh, quality data that we were able to use in our analysis. Post policy implementation or our follow up period happened over the, um, the period of 2009 to 2011. And because the way that phys ed is structured in Manitoba secondary schools, kids can take phys ed either in first semester or second semester. So just because you take phys ed, for example, in the first semester in grade 10, doesn't mean you're going to take phys ed for the, in the first semester in grade 11. You could take it in the second semester. Which kind of made our analysis a little bit difficult because it wasn't um, equal spacing between data collections. So we had unequal spacing in our data collection. We also had some missing data, so um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with schools, but I'm sure you can appreciate tracking down secondary school students uh, while they're at school is also very difficult. And again, John and his team did a great job. But because of these different um, characteristics of the study, we decided to use individual growth curve modeling to look at the trajectories of the kids' physical activity over time. This approach also allowed us to adjust for baseline <coughs> physical activity levels as well as to adjust for the rate of change over time. And this is what the data look like. Each one of these gray lines represents the student's physical activity trajectories. So the <coughs> average baseline physical activity level of the grade 9 and 10 students was 57 minutes. The average rate of decline was 3 minutes per semester. Again, we had 6 semesters in our in our analysis. We also wanted to look at um, the student data by specific characteristics that we hypothesized would have an impact on um, their physical activity trajectories, gender being one of them. So what we found was that there was a significant difference in the baseline physical activity levels of uh, boys compared to girls, but that the rate of change over time was not significantly different. <coughs> We also looked at the students um, based on physical or physical activity trajectories based on their baseline physical activity levels. So we broke it up into low, moderate, and high. And what we found again was that there were significant differences in the average rate of change over time for um, low compared to high and moderate compared to high. One really interesting thing that we found was that regardless of what their baseline physical activity levels were, the, um, in the end, all kids averaged about 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So regardless of the fact of where they started off, in grades 11, 11 or 12, whatever their final follow-up period of uh, data collection was, they averaged about 30 minutes. We also looked at this data by school neighbor, neighborhood socioeconomic status. And high, uh, kids attending schools located in high socioeconomic neighborhoods uh, participated in more physical activity than kids attending <coughs> schools in low socioeconomic neighborhoods. But again, the, um, the rate of change over time was not necessarily what we expected, um, as the kids in the attending schools in the high socioeconomic areas was significantly uh, higher than the kids attending schools in the lower socioeconomic areas. So just kind of a summary of all of the uh, information that I just provided. Consistent with previous research, decline in adolescent physical activity with increasing grade level. This has been demonstrated time and time again. And the physical activity trajectories of male and female adolescents was not significantly different. This is also consistent with previous literature. What we do feel that our study does contribute is that the decline in physical, adolescent physical activity over time was attenuated among participants with low and moderate baseline physical activity compared to students with high baseline physical activity. Now, um, some of the possible expl explanations that we can provide for this finding um, is that perhaps the influence of the phys ed policy requirement of a minimum, minimum of 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity had some influence. As I demonstrated, regardless of what the baseline activity levels were of the students, they all seemed to average out around 30 minutes. 
Now this is contradictory to what previous research has shown, which is the strongest predictor of future physical activity is baseline physical activity. So um, previous literature or previous studies have um, their baseline measures were taken in uh, childhood or early adolescence, and they found the kids who were most active at that time were most active at the follow-up measure. Well, that wasn't exactly what we found. And the, those other researchers concluded that, you know, we should invest our time and energy and resources into programs that target young kids and target early adolescents, because that's the real important developmental time. And I'm not saying that that's not a great idea, but I'm saying that this may suggest that not only do we need to invest in that time, but there may be some benefit in also investing in later adolescence as well. We also had to consider the possible explanation that it's just perhaps a regression towards the mean level of physical activity. We only had one measure at baseline, and perhaps the kids were, that um, reported a high level of physical activity just had an extraordinarily active week that week. That's a possible explanation as well. Um, also, too, we felt that our study um, uh, contributed to the, uh, to the literature in the sense that the decline in adolescent physical activity trajectories significantly were less steep among students attending schools of low socioeconomic set, located in low socioeconomic neighborhoods compared to high. And one of the explanations of this actually came out in a qualitative piece of our study um, that was done with, within the larger study, where teachers were talking about how this policy really identified a gap in the community and school programming and resources that did not target older adolescents. There weren't a lot of programming, there wasn't a lot of opportunities for older adolescents to be active either at the school or in their community. And this policy really identified that gap and made people take action so that kids could fulfill their physical activity requirements for the policy. So that was all I wanted to say about the Manitoba policy. Um, study. One of the, the other studies that I've just started to work on now is called the Ontario Mover Study. And it is also looking at physical activity as well as a policy or a, a population level approach to physical activity, but not necessarily policy, but how someone's residential neighborhood can impact physical activity. And what we're doing here is we're looking at people before they move and their physical activity levels, and then looking at how their physical activity behaviors change after they move. So well, this will be the first study to our knowledge that will actually have a pre-post design, looking at people's physical activity behaviors, and we do have outcome measures that include um, walking for transportation, walking for leisure, cycling for transportation, cycling for leisure, overall energy expenditure, etc. This is in the very early stages, but something that um, we're just starting data collection coming up in the next couple months. I've talked a lot about physical activity, and that was the, the focus of my work when I was doing my PhD, and then a little bit as well when I was doing my uh, fellowship. Right now at Public Health Ontario, I've actually been doing a lot more in um, diet and food. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but diet has actually been recognized now as the leading risk factor for chronic diseases and premature death in Canada, according to the Global Burden of Disease Study um, uh, from 2010. And what our uh, own Canadian data has shown is that young people in Canada have relatively high intakes of calories, fat, and sodium, and an increasing prevalence of nutrition-related chronic diseases such as obesity. So one of the first studies that I conducted um, as part of sort of my population uh, level um, uh, research program that was related to food was around toy premiums. So two jurisdictions in California passed a policy in 2012 whereby if you linked toy premiums with children's meals, the food in the children's meals had to meet certain nutritional criteria. And it was actually pretty strict nutritional criteria. There was no empirical scientific evidence to suggest that if you link the toys with the healthier food, the kids will choose the healthier food because of the toy. I'm sure McDonald's has known this for many years because the fast food industry invests about $350 million on their toy licenses. So I'm sure they know this, but it's never been empirically proven. So what we did was we um, partnered with a summer camp in the Waterloo region. Uh, a kid's summer camp, and we offered in our experimental group, we offered the kids four Happy Meal choices for free as part of the camp lunch program. 
Two of the choices were um, met the nutritional criteria of the California policy and came with a toy. And two of the Happy Meal choices were your regular burger, fries, and a pop and didn't come with a toy. And then in our comparison condition, the kids were offered the same four Happy Meal choices, but all of the options came with a toy. So I'm not sure if you can guess what happened, but the majority of the kids in our experimental condition, or significantly more of the kids in our experimental condition, chose the healthier meal when only the healthier meal came with the toy. Now I have to say, although, um, I don't know if ethically this is appropriate, but um, some of the kids had a really difficult time choosing between either the toys and the fries. I mean, some of these kids were six years old, probably the most difficult decision they've ever had to make. <laughs> and in the end, all of the kids got the toy, but when we were asking them to order, they didn't realize that. And it was a really difficult decision for them. Do they want the toy or do they want the fries? And we also found that the effect of the toy was much stronger among boys than it was among girls. And the kids in this study were between the ages of 6 and 12. Was just that. that study was published in the Canadian Journal of Public Health in 2012 and actually received international attention. So California was obviously very interested in it. Australia has been thinking about doing um, a similar type of policy nationwide, so they were interested in it. I don't know if you know, but in South America, um, in Brazil, they have also implemented a similar policy, except for the fact that they don't allow toys to be linked to kids' meals at all. So not, I thought it was a bit, um, I thought it was very interesting that Calif uh, California took the route of trying to encourage healthier eating with toys versus just completely eliminating toys. So I thought it was a bit of a twist and a very interesting twist that California took. One of the studies actually that I um, just am having published today in, uh, Public Health Nutrition compares the nutritional quality of food items on kids' menus across um, fast food companies that operate multinationally. So McDonald's, Burger King, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and Subway operate in um, uh, the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. <coughs> and their menus are pretty similar. And interestingly enough, what we found was that Calories, uh, relatively speaking, the United States actually, for their kids' meals, had significantly fewer calories overall in their menu items uh, compared to Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. And in terms of sodium, what we found was that the United Kingdom had significantly less sodium content in their items on their kids' menus compared to the um, other countries. Sort of the happy surprise when we were doing this, this is a pretty simple analysis, was that these findings really aligned well with the policy direction of each of these countries. So in the United States, I'm not sure if you're aware, but they have passed federal legislation around calorie labeling in their restaurants. So now every restaurant in the United States that has 20 or more outlets has to post calorie information either on their menu boards or menus. And then in the United Kingdom, they have, it's voluntary, but they've had a lot of buy-in from their restaurants in terms of trying to reduce the amount of sodium in um, foods that are prepared away from home. And they actually just released a nationwide report that's been looking or following um, sodium levels nationwide since 2008, and they've seen a significant decrease in the amount of sodium intake among their population. Or no, they're telling the truth. It was objective measures of sodium intake, yes. So they used the gold standard of urinary tests, yes. One of the other studies that I'm um, in the process of collecting data around right now um, is related to nutrition facts tables. So I have a little question here for you that if you could raise your hand. So looking at the nutrition facts table for crackers, does this product contain, and if you think it's A, please raise your hand, a lot of sodium. If you think it's B, a moderate <coughs> amount of sodium, please raise your hand. If you think it's C, a little sodium. Or D, don't know. What about if I ask this exact same question, but modify the nutrition facts table so that I was actually interpreting the percentage daily value information for you? So if I ask the question again, looking at the nutrition facts table for crackers, does this product contain now who would say a lot of sodium? Who would say a moderate amount of sodium? A little sodium? Don't know. Exactly. So 
what the purpose of this study is, um, is, is to um, help people understand and use nutrition facts table information when they are comparing and selecting foods in the supermarket. Health Canada has done some work with adults and has found that people have a really difficult time um, understanding, interpreting, and applying percentage daily value information. So they've created a campaign, I'm not sure how many people here have seen it, it's been going on for about two years now, where, is it, where negative nutrients have 15% or higher in a serving size, and it's considered high, a high amount of that nutrient, and if it can, <coughs> contains 5% or lower, it's considered a low amount. That's an educational campaign that they have been running for two years. Our argument is, why don't we just interpret that information for them? Why are, I mean, I do definitely believe in education, but why are we leaving it up to people to um, understand this information? And the funny thing is, I ta often talk to dietitians, and they don't even know that message. They have no idea that 15% is daily value is actually considered a high amount. In addition to the, oh, sorry, I was talking about percentage daily value. The first point at the top there is around serving size. So Canada actually has the most flexible regulations around serving size and what manufacturers have to follow when they're um, creating their nutrition facts tables and what serving sizes they need to follow when posting on their prepackaged foods. So as part of our study, in addition to interpreting the percentage daily value information, we were also doing some tests around um, uh, standardizing serving size. So if there's a standard serving size for cereal, for example, when you go into the grocery store, I don't know if you've ever tried to compare the nutrition facts table information across cereals, it's extremely difficult unless you're a math whiz. So for the general population, would it be easier for them to make uh, more informed choices if, standards, if the serving sizes were standardized? What if so, they were actually a serving size that people would actually eat? So we... <laughs> That is another good point, and um, the Canada's Food Guide actually has recommendations around serving size, and I'll get to that in just a sec. One, the point I wanted to make on this slide is just there's mass confusion with nutrition facts tables. They're very complicated. Whether you're talking to adults or young people, they're very difficult to understand. They're very difficult to use. So what we did for this study, it's actually funded by the Canadian Foundation for Dietetic <coughs> Research, is we um, proposed to do two studies with young people ages 16 to 24. And what we really wanted to do was to get a better idea of how this age group understands and uses the current nutrition facts table, but also to how that might change if we modify the nutrition facts table along the conditions of standardizing serving size, as well as interpreting percentage daily value information either with simple descriptors, so low, medium, high, or with simple descriptors and that color coding that I showed you where um, low would be green and high would be red. And we were doing this, we, wa we wanted to um, capture both qualitative and quantitative information. So we are in the process of doing study number one right now, where we are collecting data um, using an online survey among 2,000 young people, like I said, ages 16 to 24 from across Canada. And we just are almost done uh, the qualitative piece, where we invited um, 26 young people to come into our lab and we exposed them to whichever condition that they were randomized to in terms of the nutrition facts tables. And we put them through two behavioral tasks. The first behavioral task, we set up the lab so it sort of replicated a grocery store and a grocery shelf. And we had boxes of crackers on a grocery shelf with the modified nutrition facts table to whatever they were randomized to. We gave them money and we asked them to purchase a box of crackers using the money that we gave them. While they were doing this task, we asked them to think to, it's a um, technique called think aloud. So as they walked in the grocery store, we asked them to tell us, and we had a little bit of a practice beforehand of how to use this technique, but to talk about what are you thinking about, what are you looking at, what are you considering when you're making um, your choice. So that was the first task, and then we had a little um, interview after, just in case they had anything that, that they wanted to talk about that they didn't get a chance to during the task. And then the second part of the qualitative piece was we had a skill-based survey that has been um, used in previous studies whereby they are presented with two nutrition facts tables um, that is modified again to whichever condition that they're randomized to. And they need to um, use the information to answer the questions. Sometimes they're asked to 
compare the information on the two nutrition facts tables and sometimes they're just required to do simple math, for example, um, in order to answer the questions. And then we ask, um, we ask for their opinions afterwards. You know, would you use, do you use nutrition facts tables? Would you use this nutrition facts table? What do you think of the nutrition facts table that we presented to you? So some of the students, or some of the participants were like, I've never seen this color coding on nutrition facts table before, but I found it really easy and very quick. Because normally I would never know to look at the percentage daily value information. They also shared um, information, for example, as, um, in terms of which nutrients that they're interested in. And we got everything from, I read in a magazine that vitamin A is really important for me to grow my nails, and so I always look at vitamin A. That's how I choose my foods is based on vitamin A. <laughs> Some of the implications that um, uh, we believe will um, transpire from this study is that results will be able, uh, can provide evidence to support more effective and evidence-formed regulatory changes to nutrition facts tables. There's been a lot of talk about how to improve nutrition facts tables in Canada, but there's very little evidence about how, what would be the best ways to improve nutrition facts tables, especially among 16 to 24 year olds or younger people. There is essentially um, no research internationally with this group. Um, we could translate findings to communicating nutrition information on front of package and menu labeling initiatives. I'm not sure if you've heard, but Ontario just passed legislation um, to post calories on menus and menu boards. And some of this, um, some of the results of this study around color coding or simple descriptives may inform some of the legislation in Ontario and in other jurisdictions regarding um, uh, calorie posting. Um, it's aligned with several nutrition facts related <coughs> recommendations made by Canada's Sodium Working Group, and that's where we got a lot of the modifications that we're testing was from previous recommendations in Canada as well as in the United States, and then also too to guide school curricula. So in Ontario, students are um, first exposed to nutrition facts tables and they're taught how to use a nutrition facts table starting in grade four. Well, we are um, talking to them when they're 16 to 24, and we were actually quite surprised at how uh, well informed they are about nutrition facts tables, but we think that perhaps some of our work might be able to um, improve the, the school curricula around nutrition facts tables. And the most recent study that we've been doing around um, uh, nutrition information is we were looking at the availability of nutrition information in restaurants. So the biggest argument that the restaurant industry provides when um, advocacy groups are pushing for calorie posting on menus and menu boards, for example, is that they already provide information in restaurants. If people want information on the nutrition information on the foods that they can buy, it's already there. So we actually went into, we had two raters visit 50 restaurant locations um, of the top 10 fast food, um, fast food outlets in Canada based on sales in 2010. And they did an environmental scan to see the availability of nutrition information as well as the format and the type. So we looked at tray liners, packaging, website, and menu boards. We found that the majority of restaurants did have some type of nutritional information available, but the majority of the information that was available was not easily accessible, oftentimes required people to request information, and it often wasn't provided until after um, the, the consumers already ordered their food. And previous research has shown that if you leave all of the onus on people to ask for the nutrition information, about 0.06% will actually ask for it. So a very, very small amount. One of the larger studies that I'm working on right now, um, and it uh, started since I started working at Public Health Ontario, is looking at the impact of on-shelf labeling. Um, so, I'm not sure if you've heard of Guiding Stars or if you have Loblaws. Do you have Loblaws grocery stores in? Superstore. Superstore, okay. So yeah, they're affiliated with Loblaws. So Loblaws has actually purchased um, the rights to the Guiding Stars on-shelf labeling system. And it is a system that's been de developed by scientists and what it does is it ranks foods or rates all the foods in a grocery store, whether they're fresh, pre-packaged, etc. Um, on a scale of one to, or zero to three stars. If the product receives zero stars, there's nothing on the label. If the product receives one to three stars, it's put on the, on the shelf tag right beside the price. So we're doing a study to see if, in fact, this type of labeling system 
um, impact people's uh, food purchases or the, qual the nutritional quality of people's food purchases. We've collected baseline data before this program was implemented in Ontario. We're actually just in the um, process of collecting our second wave of data. Our first wave of data, what we were finding, um, because um, we actually had our control group where the, the program had not been implemented, and then we had um, at one of our experimental groups where it had been implemented, and not a lot of people knew of it. So um, Loblaws is actually in the process of promoting this program and starting um, up their media campaign around it, but so far that's what we've found. Hasn't had a lot of impact because not a lot of people know of it. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Dean. Thanks so much. That was really, really uh, wonderful and a really nice presentation too. I like the. Uh, <laughs> um, you did mention uh, home ec classes. Uh, those of us years ago had phys ed uh, home ec and shops through high school, grade nine and twelve. Um, comment on home ec classes. You talked talk about phys ed classes and mandatory phys ed. Did you mention home ec? Um, as part of the Manitoba um, evaluation. In in Ontario. Ontario. Right. I haven't done any specific work related to the impact of home ec classes. I know, um, well, similar to Manitoba, I'm assuming, as you mentioned, home ec is sort of a, a dying art in Ontario secondary schools as well. So um, it seems as if there's a little bit of like a resurgence of home ec in the sense that uh, a lot of people are sort of um, putting more attention or drawing more attention to the fact, you know, this is a gap in our curriculum that it's being taken away. But I don't, I haven't done any work on home ec. You did ec mention the labeling curriculum starting in grade four. So is that in math? Is that in social studies? I mean, where, where, who's putting that in? Is that in phys ed? It is. It's in the health, the health curriculum of their health and phys ed curriculum. So they're That's taking where it's healthy eating in phys ed, but they're not learning how to bake a potato. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> liability, liability. <laughs> well, I'll give you my, I have a, okay, a severe conflict of interest related to that. My, brother, my mother's a magician, my three sisters are homemade. Oh, wow. There you go. I, I, I feel really badly that it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, I think it's missing all the way. Dr. Malenko. So, uh, echo the compliments for your talk, and uh, I was thinking about something that Heather has already touched on. In this uh, Winnipeg Free Press, I think this this last Saturday. Yeah, could have been just, my mother was this Saturday. Mm. Okay. Uh, and there's a really well written article. I think there's two members are of, of our uh, human ecology faculty, which is being phased out. Uh, and the beautiful thing I remember for that was not having home ec, but teaching nutrition is akin to teaching kids about basketball and never letting them step on a court with the ball and play. And it's a really beautiful analogy. Uh, and we certainly wouldn't do that in our phys ed class, right? So, uh, but, um, so I, I agree fully with Heather. So two things, how scientifically accurate and how confident are we that nutrition facts are reliable and that they won't be different in a year or two? And number two, that sort of built into that, sitting in this room, I very often hear from clinical colleagues, uh, kids are not just little people, uh, they're different. Are the nutrition facts that are posted on can of tomatoes uh, equally relevant to a child as they are to an adult? Is it complicated? Right, right. Um, so your first question, um, I'm not sure if I understood it, um, properly, but what I was going to say is, I'm not trying to sell the fact that nutrition facts table information and you know modifying nutrition facts tables so people can use and understand them perhaps a little yeah. easier is the be all and end all solution and is going to have potentially like huge a huge impact on people's food purchases. I do think though providing information and helping people to make more informed decisions is part of the solution. So I don't think it's a magic pill that's going to solve the problem, but I do think that it's a, it can be a contributing factor to a potential solution. And then in terms of the um, whether or not nutrition facts table information is relevant to children, we chose 16 to 24 year olds because we felt that they were in a period in their life where, you know, they're shifting from, they're becoming more independent. They're starting to potentially do a little bit more of the shopping on their own for themselves and potentially even maybe having more family responsibilities to do shopping for their family. 
And because there was just such a huge gap in the literature around, you know, how do they understand information? And we did also talk to them, you know, do you use nutrition facts table information? And I mean, a lot of them said, you know, I don't, but a lot of them also said that they do. And I just, I, again, I think, I don't think that nutrition facts table information is going to solve the world's problems. But just because I, they're in that transitional period where they are going to start doing a lot of this stuff on their own, separate from their parents or their family, that we felt it was important. Yeah, I think your, well, your approach is very good, to, you know, telling us whether it's good or bad. But that uh, is the right way to go, rather than throwing a bunch of numbers. But the question is, like, where are those numbers coming from? Who says four hundred milligrams of sodium is the right amount for me to take in a day, or whatever the number is? And uh, uh, or is how it accurate? Is it how, accurate? how accurate? Right? With how confident are we that the body is that powers of those numbers and actually know the answer? So the information yeah. on the nutrition factor. How accurate are those? Is yeah. that information? If Health Canada says X number of milligrams of sodium is what I should, should be my daily max. How do they know that? Is it are all of those numbers scientifically validated? Is so are the recommended daily right. values empirically yeah. derived? Right. Yeah. Did we just start them? Yes. Didn't they just yeah, get we up just to the CBA last week? Yeah, we were at that meeting. Yeah. At least for adults. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, so actually, so the daily intake. Yeah. yeah. So our nutrition facts table information is based on a fifteen hundred milligram um, per day recommendation. Health Canada is using a 2,300 milligram um, yeah. recommendation. So we actually should, this was so designed about a year ago before the CDC's re yeah. most recent report that said, you know, potentially 2,300 milligrams of sodium isn't, you know, a terrible thing after all. Because people were pushing for the lower um, recommendation of 1,500 milligrams. I mean, in terms of the information on nutrition facts labels, it's regulated by Health Canada, so, so I, it's Health Canada. Yeah, it's Health Canada that regulates that information, um, and they've also sort of set up that percentage daily value system where you know the five percent and the fifteen percent, and we just follow um, those cut points and guidelines when we were creating yeah. that study. Yeah. As a scientist, I just I always like to know if somebody gives me a fact, is it real? And I'm just questioning, can we trust them? Uh, the New York Times had a piece as the U.S government is trying to roll out mandatory food labeling. They did a little experiment uh, for a series of different foods, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, to see what's the discrepancy between what's on the label and then what was actually in the bomb calorimeter. Uh, Subway was almost bang on for every food, but a Starbucks muffin would say 300 calories, it was actually six. Things like that. So just look at that, look it up. It's on your time. It's, uh, it's There's been other research, and um, Dr. Mary LeBay from the University of Toronto has done some, some similar types of research. And she actually found that what restaurants were posting or the nutrition information that they were providing was pretty accurate. Okay. In Canada, anyway. Her, her um, study was based in Canada, but she found it was pretty accurate. Okay. On the Manitoba day, I might have missed it, but did you have any outcome stuff with that, or was it just impact on weight or other things? Right, so we didn't actually, um, we had self-reported measures of BMI, and we used that to adjust our models, but we didn't use it as an outcome. So we were strictly using our, our continuous measure of physical activity as a primary outcome. Right, so we don't know what the impact of that has been on kids. On and weight status? Well, anything. Yeah, I mean, the policy in and of itself was directed at increasing physical activity. Right. I mean, I think maybe as a, as a secondary aim, weight status was in there. Um, but yeah, we because we have self-reported measures of BMI, I just didn't feel confident enough to use that as a primary outcome. Like I said, we used it to adjust our models, but not as a primary outcome. Ethics wasn't comfortable with us doing weight. Yeah, we pushed for it very hard. And but we, we could link the data at the Mass Center if you want. I don't know, do they have body weights? No, but we could link them for prescriptions or visit, doctor's visits, right? right. Other high, uh, long term. But what is it, uh, the, the, remind me of the time horizon on that? 2008, so they're five, five years old. So no, but how long is it being followed for? Three years. But this bacteria doesn't affect your body weight, so I don't think they have to do that. Uh, <laughs> 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 
Sharma. Arya 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 Sharma. Uh, that was a great talk, and there's kind of one elephant in the room that's pointing out to me with uh, the labeling system. So the idea is when you boil it down, my understanding is that you're just trying to make people make better informed decisions on what they're eating. At any point, did you take price into consideration in the decisions that they are making? Yeah, so when I was describing um, the task where we tried to replicate a grocery shelf and the kids were given money to purchase the crackers, we were also looking at other contextual factors that would influence purchases besides nutrition. Because, I mean, let's be honest, nutrition probably isn't the number one factor influencing kids, probably everyone's decision. Price is very important, taste is very important, brand familiarity is very important. And those are the types of things that we were trying to somewhat capture by creating this grocery store environment. So all the foods were um, had a price attached to them. They were pretty comparable across the different boxes of crackers. We tried to, um, we created our own boxes of crackers so they wouldn't be familiar with the brand. And we even counterbalanced like the colors of the crackers, what the pictures of the crackers looked like on the box, because it was quite amazing. They're like, oh, I like, I just like red better than yellow, so I'm choosing a red box. Or I really liked the picture of that circle cracker. It just looked like it would taste better, so that's why I chose that one. So we did try to capture, you're right, all of those other factors besides the nutrition information that would influence people's choices. Okay. And did it? Of course it did, yes. They, those were the, so, so when they were thinking aloud, when they were making their choices, they talked a lot. I mean, we didn't um, interject at all, so we were asking them, and, and they didn't know we were doing a study on nutrition information per se. So they were talking about, oh yeah, well the, pri the prices are all pretty much the same. Because I really like to you know, get a good bang for my buck. Whenever I'm buying anything, getting a good bang for my buck is my number one priority. Then they would talk about, oh, I really like the color of this box. Then they slowly got into like looking at the nutrition information. We didn't like try to lead them to looking at the nutrition information. All we said was, here's some money, you know, which crackers would you like to buy? You get to, we told them they get to take the crackers home with them. And I thought there was like an education of nutrition labels or reading nutrition labels or something. So the first task was going into the grocery store. So they they weren't um, made aware of the fact that we were looking at nutrition information. We just told them we were doing a food study. We're doing a study on food, and we're inviting you to come in, and you're going to get to you know, purchase a box of crackers, and we're going to ask you about food, and when you go to the grocery store and buy food. So we, that's how we introduced the study to them, so they weren't made aware of the fact that we were really looking at nutrition information and how they use it. Kelly, I'll come back. I was wondering, uh, for the Manitoba Physical Activity Study, when you talked about interpreting your results, maybe some kids just had super active weeks. If, conversely, you collected injury data, and if the little Johnny broke his leg and was out for eight weeks. Right, so one of our ex um, exclusion criteria for the kids, so they um, were invited to participate in the study, but we didn't necessarily use their data if they met, um, if they didn't meet certain criteria so if they weren't able-bodied for example in the sense of you know did they have a broken leg then they were still invited to participate but we didn't use their data in this study. And so follow-up you... follow data no. if they were if they had a broken leg they weren't participating. Post hoc if any time in the three years they broke their leg they were out. No well not out for good but out for that data class. But it is I you want to know whether that the increased activity caused a break in their leg, right? Is that what you're yeah. Well, I'm just thinking about the whole relationship right. between kids and socioeconomic right. status and organized sports and exposure okay. opportunity. And so how did the broke, does the broke Like if the break? kid broke his leg and wasn't able to participate, meet his 30 minutes a day criteria. Right. Did you know that or did they just hand in their accelerometer and you had and their self-report of how much activity they did. Like, could you adjust for the fact that they were unable to do physical activity during that so seven-day period? Yeah. So, the, I mean... Those numbers would be really, really small. We could go back and look. They had logbooks, I you know. They definitely had logbooks, which, I mean, could have been captured that way. Melissa, who was our research assistant who was tracking these kids down after baseline, I mean, she would have, you know, spoke with these kids face to face. I don't remember ever her reporting, you know, 
would we want to do this child with a broken leg or, or whatever, but yeah, we didn't necessarily consider that. Realistically, we would have excluded them because they probably wouldn't have worn the accelerometer enough right. for us to get validated. And we used like our um, wear time was consistent with previous you know, accelerometer studies where the kids had to wear the accelerometer for at least eight hours a day on three days of the seven, for example, as a minimum. So, you still have a question? Well, like, actually, that one just answered there. I was confused about that study, because uh, it reminded me of the work by Ian Jansen and yeah. Bob Ross, and when they, because I thought you were talking about within the phys ed classroom, and, you know, their research suggested that you might get five to ten minutes of actual exercising in a gym class, so the likelihood of that helping child with obesity is slow. So. But I didn't quite get the, how long they were wearing the accelerometers. So. so they wore the accelerometer for all of waking time. So they were asked to take the accelerometer off while they were sleeping, showering, or swimming. And they wore the accelerometer for the entire day for a seven day period. And this phys ed policy, um, as that physical activity practicum where they're required to participate in 30 minutes of water to vigorous physical activity, I actually didn't mention this, but they can do that in school whether that's through sports or intramurals or phys ed class, but they're also given the option to do it outside of school hours. So if they're already participating in recreational hockey or competitive basketball, or you know they're taking their dog for a walk for 30 minutes every day, that also counted towards the 30 minutes of water to vigorous physical activity requirement. So that's why we chose to um, ask the kids to wear the accelerometer for the entire waking day. Sorry, Megan, Liz, and that's so I was wondering when you showed the graphs um, for the activity study and the kids who started out at a low level just kind of stayed the same. Yeah. Um, do you have any sort of previous data before this um, policy implementation? Because would you have expected those kids to also decline and your this policy kind of stopped them from doing that? Like that would be positive, right? But right. So um, we don't have any data for this particular study, so we, our, our baseline data collection was 2008, which was the year before the policy was implemented, and then we followed them over time. However, uh, previous studies have shown that kids who start off with a lower level of physical activity, their rate of, the, they still do decline. So in that baseline physical activity is the strongest predictor of future physical activity levels. So we can somewhat potentially suggest that Maybe the phys ed policy had some influence in these low active kids at baseline. Maybe it helps them to you know, lessen the attenuation of their physical activity trajectory. I mean, I can't say that for sure because you know, we didn't have a control group, et cetera, et cetera, but it's possible. Please. Can I just clarify, I mean, maybe I have it wrong. It's a phys ed policy, it is not a phys ed class. <coughs> Correct. So grade 11 and 12s don't necessarily attend any class. They have to document their minutes of exercise. So Outside, and it's not, like it's not a structured. We think of going to phys ed class. Right. This is a policy where they have to do this. Like the parent has to sign off or whatever. Yeah. Am so I, it about, is, am I right there? Or wrong? So <laughs> it is a phys ed policy that has some flexibility built into it because the education people did a lot of background work and asked what, how would a phys ed um, curriculum in grades 11 and 12 work? You know, what is realistic? And so what they found out was they, um, the schools and the feedback that they received from community parents, students, et cetera, there needs to be a lot of flexibility built in. So some schools have an implementation model where it's 100% in school, it's phys ed class. Some schools have a 50-50 implementation model, for example, where 50% of the phys ed credit is done in class during school time and 50% is left to the kids to do outside of school time. So there's different implementation models. We do have some data around implementation models. We couldn't include it in um, this study, but we're doing a follow-up study, um, some analysis right now for a follow-up paper that will include that information so we can see if the kids that are attending schools using the 100% implementation model, do they fare better than the kids who are attending school with a 50-50 model or a 25 cent? It's my understanding some of that is called practicalities. When you have one double gym for 1,500 kids, exactly. yeah. and no, you know, yes, you can go outside, etc. 
I think the philosophy too was also to try and get, you know, try not to put all of the onus on schools to be responsible for kids' physical activity. Let's try and get the community involved. Let's try and um, get other stakeholders involved so that it can be more of a uh, multi-stakeholder approach that's responsible for, you know, getting our community and our kids more active. So I think that was also a little bit of the philosophy, but yeah, I think practicality was a big part too. <laughs> And we, we did publish a paper, submit a paper for publication, just cross-sectionally, comparing kids who were in phys ed that semester versus kids who were out of phys ed that semester. The difference in moderate to vigorous physical activity was about three minutes for those who were in phys ed in that semester compared to those that weren't. Um, but the percentage of kids who met the guidelines, met the 60 minutes per day, increased, I think it was 75%, like almost doubled which is another important thing to consider, is that while 95% of the kids don't meet the guidelines, boys are still getting, on average, 65 minutes of this day. They're just not getting it on every day. And, and, our, that's, that's and, our, yeah, and our accelerometer data show that at baseline, kids were about 57 minutes. So although the Canadian Health Measures Survey results say 93% of kids aren't getting 60 minutes, but the majority of them in our data are getting 57 minutes. So it's pretty close to 60 minutes, and that message I've never heard can from the Canadian Health Measures Survey. I mean, I think it's great to try and achieve 60 minutes, but we're pretty, I mean, the kids are pretty close. I don't know if you're familiar with the um, Active Healthy Kids Canada report card and how we've received, Canada has received an app for kids' physical activity for the last seven years straight. And yet, that report card has never communicated the message as an encouraging one in the sense that, okay, we, we're not getting 60 minutes, but we're, you know, we're doing pretty well. Because it's hard to believe. I mean, we put a lot of resources in Canada. Definitely we can do better. But there are, there's, there are a lot of programs targeting kids' physical activity. And it would just be nice to sort of hear, I guess, the whole story and not just the fact that we're not getting 60 minutes. I'm giving the whole story Saturday at 1130. All right. <laughs> For that same conference that Aaron is attending, that, with that exact same, that's the exact same uh, message that so I think Heather had one, and then we'll go to the um, I have a quick question. Like, uh, whether you can give us a cap. So, so you work for Public Health Ontario. Maybe you said this at the beginning. I just did. You talked about health policy policies. You as a researcher within Public Health Ontario, how do your results get translated to someone who's actually in a policy-making position? And how does Health Canada take Ontario data within Public Health Ontario and use that? So, um, at Public Health Ontario, we're an arm's length agency responsible for giving scientific and technical advice to our Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. I don't have an, uh, like a, I personally don't have a direct contact within the ministry. I just more or less share my findings the way most academics share their findings through publications and conferences. Now, my chief who I report to, she will regularly meet with the ministry and oftentimes take you know some of my results and share it with them to try and inform some of the decisions that they're making at the provincial level. But I pretty much operate as, a, as an academic in that sense. So in your sense then, how much leeway does the provincial government have versus the like, federal government does all the labeling laws? Right. So Ontario doesn't have much leeway there. Um, so my curriculum lab leeway, but that's it, right? right? So my, um, my labeling study, our sample is actually across Canada, and it was funded by the Canadian Foundation for Dietetic Research, so it's a national body. Um, and Public Health Ontario supports uh, my work, you know, with specific to Ontario, but also for all of Canada as well. So I have a little bit of leeway there in terms of whether or not I want to focus directly on the province. Or okay. But if you want to know about translation, uh, Aaron shared a story with me about the impact of her research when you started talking to industry about implementing the red, yellow, right. green, right? Yes. How did industry take that? that so the Canadian Foundation for Dietetic Research, they do have a scientific side, but they also you know, do a lot of work with the Grocery Manufacturers Association of Canada, um, with the Food Producers of Canada, which represents billions and billions of dollars of um, uh, food manufacturing. And they asked me to come, they funded my research, and they asked me to come and present just what we're planning or what we had proposed to do. So I did, and um, 
I got a lot of resistance from industry. They were basically telling me no matter what my results say, they are not going to do it because it's going to cost them way too much money to do this. Um, I mean, I basically said, well, if it's regulated, then yeah, you will, you will do it, but. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's to be seen what's going to be, what's going to happen, but they felt very threatened and were not at all excited about what we were doing. I mean, they know our behavior well, right? They absolutely. study us to death to know how we're going to, or what we're going to reach for on that aisle, in that aisle. Well, and I mean, the toy premium study, I think that speaks volumes in the sense that fast food companies spend, you know, $350 million on toy licenses. They've been doing this for the last 25 years. I remember growing up with my brother having to have the treat of the week from McDonald's every single week. We just we had to go to McDonald's and get it. So they know exactly what they're doing, and you know we're sort of behind the ball a little bit. But. Anyways, thank you very much. That was great. A lot of